Them some loud ass birds. You will have a pleasant day today. It's Kendall here. If you're new around here, welcome. If you're not new around here, what is up home skillet biscuit? And happy Saturday. If you don't know what Saturday is, Saturday is when I do a little something on my channel called Bad Movies and a Beat. The series on my channel where I talk about bad movies while putting my makeup on. Now, <laughs> I was already prepared to record um, a video last week. I had one already finished or whatever, but you know, the way the fates align, it was completely out of focus. Let me check actually. But it worked out because um, again, the video was out of focus. I hated my makeup by the end of it. And also today I am referring to one of the more convoluted movies that I've ever done for this series. And because of that, even my delivery was equally making no sense at some point. Very convoluted. Almost as convoluted as the storyline of Hereditary. Boom, bang, shots fired. Don't come for me. I don't want to hear it. I said what I said. Midsummer is a better movie. If, if you don't follow me on Twitter, you have no idea what this is. <laughs> I've been ranting over the last few weeks. Maybe. Time is an illusion. How long has it been? Maybe a week. I've watched both of Ari Aster's films, Hereditary, full of films, Hereditary and uh, Midsommar. And Midsommar is the superior film. And it costs quite the heated discussion. I sound very angry. I'm not angry. I'm just impassioned. I should make a video on that. I should prove to you. <laughs> I should go brick by brick why Midsommar is the better movie. Anyway. I don't care, watch whatever you want. But anyway, outside of that, the stress of just having a full like two and a half hour video <laughs> just go poof really makes me think I need a drink. That wasn't a very good lead in. Here's sponsorship, Kendall. Why, hello there. Kenny from the past to let you know that this video is sponsored by Bright Cellars, the monthly wine club that allows you to discover your new favorite wines. For those of you that are not aware, I am currently on a lifelong journey to being the rich auntie. And one of the things that you have to do as the rich auntie is have a plethora of references, information, and tastes associated with wine. And that's why I'm slowly curating auntie cred. Bright Cellars is allowing me to test out six bottles of wine per month that lets me get closer to peak auntie status, okay? So I have the wine. I also bought a super extra tool robe. And then all I need is like like a 98 year old husband who's um, mysteriously disappeared. Working on it. Now, because wine is just as individual as those drinking it, Bright Cellars allows you to do a quiz that allows you to hone in your wine recommendations that they send you every month. Things like dark chocolate, how you take your tea or coffee, all of these can culminate into what would be the best wines for you to try. Bright Cellars is incredibly convenient because they'll ship curated boxes to you every month right at your doorstep. And if there's any that you don't like, Bright Sellers will replace it with the next month's shipment with their concierge service. But to me, the coolest part, they send detailed cards about each of your wines. And then on the back, it gives you information about what would be a good pairing with it food wise. Um, it gives you key notes like perfume, which I find very fascinating. Today, I'm going to be trying, well, I've actually already tried it, I already like it quite a bit. This is Calypto. Uh, Calypto is a 2020 Sauvignon Blanc with notes of grapefruit, lime, kumquat, and peach. And some suggested pairings are fresh cheeses and fish tacos with crunchy slaw. I've been drinking water out of this glass already, so my lipstick's on it. Boo hoo, don't bother me. To be honest with you, I find it interesting that they s refer to the peach being very, like one of the later notes, but I actually get peach more so than I get anything else. I do taste maybe a little bit of citrus, so lime, so peach and lime. That's really nice. I'm gonna drink this in a bubble bath tonight. Again, peak auntie. I'm I'm earning my bearings. I'm earning that title. Anyway, click the link below to get 50% off of your first six bottle box, plus an extra free bottles. So seven bottles. <laughs> Get 50% off of seven bottles. And when you do click the link, you do support the channel. So I really appreciate you doing so. Make it so that more people wants to give me money and free wine. Love it here. Big thanks to Bright Sellers for sponsoring today's video. And let's get back to the debauchery. The last time we were here, we returned to the cesspool that is Passion Flicks. And we watched the horrid, dirty, sexy saint. Title says it all. <laughs> No, it doesn't actually, it says nothing. <laughs> it's actually very poorly titled. Um, if you'd like to check it out though, feel free to check it out up above or you can check it out in the Bat Movies in a Beat 
playlist. Now, I said that as if we're not leaving the cesspool of passion flicks this week. I try, I try, and this is what I said last time. The thing about passion flicks, it is, it's just in this odd way, completely addictive and engrossing. So in an effort to not stay there, I try to not stay there, but. <laughs> While I was doing the last video, I ended up seeing a trailer for Passion Flix's newest venture into the supernatural romance genre. And this still, <laughs> this still says it all. And I just couldn't let a sizable amount of time and the risk of me forgetting that this is out there somewhere waiting, stop me from doing two, two Passion Flix videos right after another. By the way, if you don't know what Passion Flix is, I always feel like I have to do my little plug for them, even though, again, this is completely unpaid. I do this every time. But if you don't know what Passion Flix is, it's essentially the love child of lifetime crappy romance meets shitty erotic novel. So they're like a R-rated lifetime. All of the movies, or at least all the ones that I've seen, are in some way adaptations of romance novels but they're made in this very peculiar, low budget way that, I don't know, it's completely and utterly entrancing, enticing. Like you can't help, like they're so bad. They're not sexy, they're not funny. They're not even all that entertaining, but I can't, I keep coming back for more. What does that say about me? And also, as a side note, somebody told me this um, in the comments of the last video, that the CEO, the owner of Passion Flix is actually Tosca Musk, AKA Elon Musk's sister. Damn, all the money in the world and y'all still making sh on purpose. But today again, we're dipping into a territory of which I've never seen from Passion Flix. If you're ever gonna get the free trial. <laughs> today we're looking at the Passion Flix movie, Wicked. Not to be confused with the musical, because everybody was coming for me when I was like, wow, the music in this is great, but the movie sucks. And this movie is essentially everything that all the other movies were missing from Passion Flix. It has danger, it has bad CGI, it has even worse wigs, Sharpie tattoos, and just a cluster of supernatural shit that doesn't make sense. A comedic element that I, I, I would only hope is ironic, like you know. I feel like every movie on Passion Flix is very self-aware. It knows what it is. Before we even get started, I figured I'll take the, the initiative and make a key terms list before we even get into it. Be sure to copy it in your notebooks and reference it for the quiz. Number one, one, we have the other world. The other world is like a supernatural world where all the supernatural things live and from which all the supernatural things are coming to earth. Now, the main bad guys in the movie are called the Fae. The Fae are like a vampire adjacent being that kills human beings for no reason, I guess. I don't know. I don't know why they're killing them now that I think about it. They just kill them for no reason. There's parts of this movie where they're literally just living. <laughs> I guess they're perceived dangerous. They're very bad at explaining what the actual danger of the Fae is, but um, Sure. The Fae also have the ability to camouflage themselves as human, but if they're in their natural form, you can see them with like silver skin and they have these like bright teal, blue, green eyes. They also have the ability to compel human beings into doing things. Then you have the ancients, which are like the super Fae. They have all the abilities that the other Fae's do, but they just don't hide themselves for some reason. They just walk around being super phased. They have the ability to conjure items that they've touched before. So like weapons and whatnot. Apparently they can't be killed by the same means as the other fae. They have to be stabbed with like a special stake made out of some mystic ash tree or, that no one can find or some shit. It's a whole thing. You have the order, which is the organization that our main character is a part of, consisting of people who were born into this organization and whose job it is to kill off the fae. And then last but not least, we have the halflings. Half human, half fae. Bye, racial girl. Now that you've been sufficiently informed and indoctrinated, let's embark down the cesspool that is wicked. The movie begins and I am now officially convinced that every passion flicks film starts with that font. They literally took title screen presets from Final Cut Pro. Like I could open up my videos like that. Now the movie is set in New Orleans. Shout out to my daddy people. The thing about <laughs> movies set in New Orleans I've noticed is that they're shockingly unseasoned. <laughs> Shout out to Tall Girl. Yes, I know they're making a second one. 
please stop telling me. I know. I, I'm just as distraught as you are, like, <laughs> that we're doing this again. But yeah, the whole movie is very unseasoned, but particularly the main character, Ivy, the pretty redhead with the serious disposition. Now, Ivy is a part of the Order, the secret organization made to get rid of the phase. And Ivy was born See, this is confusing already. I don't know if she was born into the order because she's adopted, because of course she has the main character story. So of course she was. Her birth parents are dead and her adopted parents are dead. So I think her adopted parents were a part of the order, but she's in the group. Now during the daylight hour, she's but a simple college student studying like social work or something. And then at night, she's a badass killing machine. Love that for her. And because passion flicks is nothing if not a cliche, she has a annoyingly flippant black friend, a general serious dry disposition, a seemingly endless supply of witty retorts. Now speaking of witty dialogue, um, this movie is probably riddled with it even more so than other films that I've seen from passion flicks. This movie is riddled in a painful way with very, very stinky cheese. It is some of the cheesiest sh I've ever seen. But you never do such a thing because I'm your bestest friend in the world. Is. You can't go a full scene without at least something that makes you physically cringe. It's almost impressive. I totally do you. You know I swing both ways. I like boys. Girl, happy pride. I get, girl, I, what? Maybe I'm tripping. But I, it's been a shockingly long time since I've heard someone refer to bisexuality as quote, swinging both ways. I don't want to speak over people, especially people who live their lives in their identity and their bisexuality. But I just, as an ally, I, I just, I just wonder. <laughs> That's that's the word I should say. Do 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 hello bisexuals. Hey bisexuals. Have they, do y'all refer to yourselves as swinging both ways? It feel a little it feel a little off. I can't quite <laughs> I just haven't heard, I mean, I don't know, maybe there's something quite archaic about the term, so it makes me feel a little weird, but okay, maybe it's just me. My opinion doesn't matter in this discourse anyway. Before we can really let the questionable weirdness sink in, we are attacked with the almost equally offensive <laughs> CGI. Oh my God. Now, as far as I'm aware, this is uh, Passion Flix's first attempt at doing the supernatural genre. This is a genre that asks, you know, a bit more of them in a way that I don't think they were sufficiently prepared for, right? I gotta remember, they know what they're making. They know, they sat there and filmed it, they edited it, but I can't help but feel like some a ball was dropped, even if they never picked the ball up ever in the first place. They never attempted to take a shot, but I just, I don't know, I want better for everyone. <laughs> but it just feels very much so like a situation where, I don't know, somebody just had to take on more than they were prepared for. I think they really took the intern that went to get coffee and say, hey, you're promoted, <laughs> get in that editing room and you just panicked and then this is what happened. Ivy and the black friend, her name is Val. Ivy and Val notice a fae hiding itself amongst the humans. They're ready to go after the fae because they have this thing that's like a clover necklace that allows them to not get compelled. But they decide to wait until nighttime to go after the fae for some reason. They never really explain that either. Is it that the fae only kill at night? Like they never really explain that. They just say, yeah, she has the time to be a college student during the day and then at night she hunts the fae. But while on one of her fae killing sprees, Ivy stabs one, they give us a good old CW50 edit job and then she is met with a different, more powerful being. Woo! Conjures up a wig. Oh, conjure up a gun. <laughs> conjure up a gun. By the way, I don't know why a supernatural being needs a gun. At that point, he's just a guy. <laughs> he's no more dangerous than any other human being. He's using a gun. Anyway, Ivy throws her dagger at him only to realize it doesn't work because again, he's something different. In realizing that she's met a new type of danger, she ends up trying to escape only to be grazed with a bullet on her side. Bleeding profusely as she runs away though, she ends up collapsing on the stairs of her organization on the way to see their doctor. She's found by the doctor and this mysterious man named Ren. And if you're wondering, yes, 
He's the heartthrob of this movie. He is indeed the homme du jour. Homme du jour. And she's like, yeah, I was shot by a fae. And they were like, no, you weren't. Fae's don't use guns. Okay, so my blood is just from my mind. It's just all in my head. I'm just bleeding to death because I thought I was. Okay, Ivy passes out theoretically from like blood loss or just the shock of the whole situation only to be awoken by her boss, David, the silver fox daddy. I know he was fine 20 years ago. Did he fine now? He got a son. Does he look old enough to have like a, oh, I don't think he old enough to have like a 25 year old son. Well, if your old lady don't treat you, if your old lady don't treat you right, <laughs> I won't either. <laughs> Anyway, she explains the event of the night prior about how she stabbed it with iron and that didn't kill him. And he's like, well, that means it's an ancient, one of the super phase. Now the ancients had not been seen in the city for a very long time. Hence why everyone was so skeptical about her seeing one. They had supposedly been sealed on the other side of the other world, never to interact with the humans, which as I'm saying that aloud right now, I realize that, okay, how does that make sense? Because um, regular phase are just chilling out on the street, but you were able to stop the most powerful ones, but you couldn't stop the regular ones. Okay, but yeah, apparently they're all supposed to be in the other world, not interacting with the order at all. So in order to not have the members of this organization whose entire purpose is to kill the Fae, not panic. He says, don't tell anybody what, what you think you saw until he's able to talk to the other sex around the area. I say in order to not have people go into a panic, but they don't really explain this at all. So that may not even be the reason. They just say, don't tell people essentially until I can talk to the other sex. Doesn't that seem dangerous to not let people know who are out there every day doing this job, not know that there's a particular new threat. So after getting treated, because again, this shot was apparently just a graze that was aggravated by her running. So she's able to go home after she gets patched up. That is where she's greeted by her pet. <sighs> a shirtless, presumably gay man <laughs> named Tink. I don't know if this is homophobia. <laughs> but it feels like homophobia, <laughs> you know what I mean? It tastes, it's like LaCroix homophobia. It has the, the, the idea, the essence of homophobia. Again, happy pride month, but he's a very annoying fairy type creature that has a sugar addiction. Now, Tink effectively serves as the comedic relief, quote unquote, through the movie, which I find funny because there's no actual tension built the entire movie. So what do we really need a comedic relief for? Tink is just this annoying little ball of information. He is of the other world. So he does help Ivy regarding certain things, especially as this seemingly new version of the Fae are entering into the earthly realm. Ivy, determined to find out even more about the Fae and particularly what they're doing in New Orleans, goes to this club that presumably is free frequented by a lot of them. There she sees her coworker, Douche Nugget. His name is Trent. I call him Douche Nugget. Now Douche Nugget is the worst. He's misogynist. Says something along the lines of like, we shouldn't have let women in the order. And then, and he quickly gets his balls bashed in. And honestly, there's not a whole lot more you need to know about him after this. He's not gonna make it to the end, so it's fine. But anyway, Ivy goes out looking for Badwig, finds him, and then she's stopped in a very sexually charged way because this is passion flicks by Ren, who's like, if you go after it, you will not survive. And then at some point he refers to as quote, a bundle of kick-ass hotness. And you're one bundle of kick-ass hotness. I just saved your life, sweetness. Why? Why? Why is there always a nickname? Why is that necessary? And it's always the worst ones. Again, questioning, much as I did last time, questioning who thought, yup, this is it. We've done it. We've cracked the code. This is romance. Well, I can't even get mad at them because here I am watching so many of these movies and I just, uh. Like, I don't need to be reminded that I'm watching a romance. I know. The giant passion flicks that flashes across the screen before I got here told me everything I needed to know. I don't need to be reminded of my own bad choices. But after this, weirdly sexually charged encounter, Ivy listens and goes home. The next day, back at the order. Douche Nugget, who's still pissed from her giving his balls the business. But here comes Ren to save the day because this is a romance movie. The other thing that Zadi wants her, <laughs> David, 
Daddy David wants her to do is to take Ren on like a tour essentially of New Orleans because he's coming in from Colorado. He's a new member of the order and he needs to get familiar with the area so that he can do his job. So that was her job to show him around. She reluctantly agrees. Back at her home, she's asleep and guess who breaks in through her window? She ends up about to stab him, which is the first thing that made sense of this entire movie ever. He turns it into some weird like, ooh, my dick swole. <laughs> this conversation has taken a weird turn. If you slide an intro so down, things are gonna get real awkward. And other just like tonally dissonant uh, retorts, something about, wow, you're a feisty firecracker. I'm sure your boyfriend's so happy with you. And she's like, my boyfriend's dead. <laughs> And he's like, whoa, I'm sorry. I shouldn't, I'm sorry. In order to make amends and reconcile this weird relationship that they have already, this is fan fiction, just keep up, I know. They go to get a meal together, talk over some developments in regards to the ancients and the Fae. So apparently Ren is actually a member of a secret group within the secret group. So within the order, there's another group called the elite. Primary goal is to track down and kill ancients. I'm just saying if all of their job is to take down the Fae, wouldn't you think it's important for everyone to know that there's this super demon thing out here that we may encounter whilst doing our jobs? And apparently as um, Ivy tells Ren, several of the members of the order have been dying left, right, and center over the course of the last few months. So they're like, hey, maybe it's dangerous to not tell people, anywho. And so she says this, she says, why is this not something that we all know? Is this not like dangerous? Quote, they are so rare and they don't usually engage the order, even though the reason we're sitting here is because they did explicitly that. So that's stupid. And she's just like, sure. See, this is why I can't enjoy movies because you just say and expect me to, expect me to not question that. Their entire job, all of them, is to kill the Fae. And you don't think they would ever come in contact with one of the like super strong ones, what? But apparently more Fae are coming through a gateway that neither of them know where it is. A gateway to and from the other world. The Order are losing more and more people, particularly those that guard these gates. But as the fall equinox gets closer, sorry, I'm, my eyes are starting to glaze over because this is, as the fall equinox comes upon us, that gate grows weaker, meaning that even more things from the other world could come through the gate. So again, going back to the Fae, right? They've been coming through this gate. You're telling me that the weaker of their beings are more likely to get through that gate, but the stronger ones can't? Pardon? And another thing that doesn't make sense, I'm sorry is that the elite whose job it is to kill the ancients have no idea where these gates are. They just know it exists and that it's in, you know, most major cities, but we have no idea where they are. So the less qualified people guard the gates, but the people whose job it is to kill the job to do that job, sorry, whose job it is to kill the stronger beings don't know where they're even coming from. So love that. Also, how are you keeping it a secret that the ancients are coming through the gates when you have basic people guarding it? I'm sorry. So Ren is the one that lets Ivy know that they can only be killed with this special stake that's made out of some tree of the other world. It's very difficult to get and he only has one. On their way back, they end up spotting an ancient who uses some compelling on a random girl to get her to leave her boyfriend. And Ivy tries to stop this, but Ren says don't for some reason, because, well, you, because they're so strong that she'll die immediately, basically. What they come to find out is that this ancient is actually someone of high prominence in the city. Like he's very famous. So it's interesting that an ancient is like hiding in plain sight. Now, because Ivy is thinking at all, and apparently that looks like it's distressing her, according to Ren, he kisses her on the cheek. What the hell? You look like you use one. I look like I could use a kiss on the cheek. Why does everything in this movie stink so bad? He walks her home and this weird interaction is the beginning of feelings. So the movie wants me to believe. 
The next day, I'm sorry, the scene is just so bizarre. Um, they meet up to do this tour thing that, that she was supposed to take him on. And they end up hearing a woman scream. And there's also that stock scream there. The, ah, ah, that one. Did you hear that? Yeah. And they find a woman who's like bit a guy who's now dead on the ground. And she's like screaming. And there's these two guys. And I still, despite watching this movie several times, have no idea what or who these people are supposed to be. Are they just normal people? Why are they just standing there like, oh bro, that's crazy in this alleyway when this woman is obviously murderously insane and they look frightened. So they're not other Fae. They're not other order members because that's literally their job to restrain her. So they didn't take her down. They're just people, just dudes. <laughs> Anyway, Ivy comes in, knocks her out, and apparently she had just been bitten by a face, so she was going kind of insane. Also, this is broad daylight, so apparently they do bite during the day hours. But anyway, but she knocks out, and then uh, Val comes from somewhere, and she's like, hey, can you handle this? And she's like, okay. I don't know where she came from, but sure. Ren saves Ivy from getting ran over by a moped. Because sure. And this is supposed to be a moment. Ivy's big ass mouth tells Val about the secret elite. Val says that her mom used to talk of the ancients and there's a whole court devoted to them, like a royal court. There's a princess, a prince. They're like super bad news if they can somehow get through the gate. Again, they're the most powerful beings, but everybody else can get through this damn gate, but they can't. Okay, cool. And apparently the ancients in New Orleans may be trying to open the gates for them. But uh, we don't have time to worry about the logistics of that because it's time to do a date thing because uh, Ren comes in, gives her a rose. She's confused as I was, cause like what? He, he says something about her being sweeter than beignets. I miss beignets. I haven't had a beignet in a very long time. So they're on their mission to stalk out the Fae with the Shoshomaru wig. They end up tracking him to a club that apparently a bunch of Fae frequent, which I find strange if you're, again, if your whole job is to take down the Fae, they all go to the same space. Like they're all in the same area, like what? Anyway, so they go to the back of the club to get information and then, um, then this happens. Wow, okay. The next day we find out that Douche Nugget dies. Oh, <laughs> I don't give a fuck. Now all of the order are ordered to um, work in pairs and you know where that's going, of course. But um, also Sexy Daddy goes up, that's not his name, David. David the Sexy Daddy, Daddy Sexy David, David, mm. Goes up to Ivy. <laughs> and treats her quite suspiciously because he assumes that someone in the order is giving information out to the ancients and the Fae. I don't know why he feels this way. I don't know why he feels like it's Ivy because she just got shot by an ancient, but okay. Ivy and Ren get dressed up to go to this club to stake it out on the inside. She gets dressed up. There's this feverishly uncomfortable encounter where he sees her for the first time and it's supposed to be romantic. Oh, sweetness, you are so beautiful. I can't even contain myself. Like, ugh, the f Okay. They go to the club, everybody smashing in the club. Apparently this club is frequented by a lot of humans and Fae, which also leads me to question if they can interact in this capacity, like in this place and no one's dying, it's not like some giant bloodbath, which leads me to wonder are the Fae even like dangerous as a, as a race of things? <laughs> Feels very eugenics. <laughs> very genocide even, but make it sexy, <laughs> I don't know. But they get there and they're like, we gotta blend in to all the sexy people. So let's dance on the floor really sexily. And they play a really good song, by the way. This this movie really does hone in that really bad movies tend to have really great songs. Cause, but the song plays and they do the crossfades and she's breathing all heavy. And he's like contemplating the thought of giving her the digitization in the middle of the club but she breaks away and she's like oh i'm gonna go get information and before she can meet up with him she ends up getting partially compelled by a fae there which lead me to question how wasn't the whole point of your necklace that you don't get compelled or did you take your necklace off because it didn't match the outfit like what 
Ren is able to get her away before things go too far because he just like pulls the fire alarm and that shocks her, gets her out of her trance enough that she was able to get away before things got worse. Then, because we need it, there's this whole like quote unquote frustrated breakdown confession where he's like, I know you feel for me. I felt your body go alight. You're acting like nothing happened between us. You lit up for me like a goddamn firework. Is the reason you're not going forth with this because of your dead boyfriend and you still have feelings for him? Yikes. I will always love him, but like, no, I don't feel that way. And he's like, oh, okay. And at some point they kiss. I don't know how, I don't know what, I don't know anything. In order to get more information about the ancients, about the gates, specifically where the gates are, because again, for some reason, they don't know that they're doing all this shit, but don't know where the gates are. They go to Ivy's friend's house. Her name is Brighton. And her mother apparently is the old wise woman that has information about the Fae. Um, apparently she's been bitten by a Fae, so she's a little not all there. Upon seeing her, she tells them that there are actually two gates. She tells them that the gate is in the sanctuary, which is very vague. Like this is New Orleans. I'm sure there's hella churches. It's a very black city. There's always hella churches in a very black city. Um, that's the one that you'll need to guard. And the other one is elsewhere. That one doesn't matter. We don't ever find it. I guess it's closed, whatever. And before they can get more information, she has like a, like a manic break. You know, they always do that for like the wise old character in like a horror movie. They always have to have like a, like a, episode before you can get more information is so stupid so the daughter is like yeah I'm a, i think y'all should leave and so they leave before they do though she does mention the halflings apparently there aren't many halflings because part of the elite's job is to kill them off again very genocidal we love that because apparently uh, if you if you mix a halfling and an ancient they do the boom chicka wow wow and they have a baby apparently that baby has the ability to bring forth the apocalypse. It's able to make so that all the gates ever made are completely and utterly useless and that everything from the other world can come into the earth world. That is including the royal family. Part of the elite's job is to kill all the halflings so that just won't happen. Now there's some logistic things about where all the halflings are. For some reason, they're all adopted. I don't really get but sure, they're all adopted and apparently some of them are in the order. If you recall, Ivy is adopted. So she's like, is it me? And he's like, no, you got shot. Like, why would they shoot? Why would they shoot you? Like if, if they knew that they needed you for this thing. Granted, the Fae can't even tell who's a halfling unless they smell their blood. You're not a halfling. And it would really suck if you were a halfling because you know, they gotta die. He commences to tell a story that serves two purposes. One, to let us know that he's really um, been in situations where he had to kill people that really mattered to him after finding out their halfling, like his friend was a halfling when he was a child and then something he did made it known to the broader public that he's a halfling, so he died. Steak, the one that he was talking about, how he only has one of, if you use that on a halfling, their blood will start to bubble and that's how you know they're a halfling. So he tells the story so that we know that A, he has been in situations where that choice was made and it was very difficult and B, because we need to have trauma bonding and you know him being vulnerable as an aphrodisiac. And these stories I've noticed are very big on fetishizing male trauma. And they start making out and we see his sharpie, ugly ass tattoos. Why, why, who did this to you? Back at home, Ivy grills Tank on his knowledge of the halflings. He also goes on this whole woe is me thing because he was the reason why there's one gate that's still open. <laughs> he dropped the ball because he didn't know there was a second gate and now we're all fucked. Apparently the only way to open said gate fully, I suppose is what they're trying to get at, is to use the blood of an ancient on the outside of the door to open it for the royals to come through. If you use the blood of an ancient on the other side of the door, so within the other world, that will close the door, it will seal the door. Ivy lets David Daddy know about what she learned about the gates and the equinox. Apparently the equinox is two days away. And I guess just now he's considering letting the people know that there's ancients afoot because it's two days away from an apocalyptic war. <laughs> so sure, let them know now. And at the end of this meeting, Ivy also tells Val that she thinks that someone in the order is talking to the Fae and she's not at all suspicious upon bringing up that information. Someone in the order is working with the Fae. Holy crap. Um, I have to go. 
but I'll call you later. Ren gives Ivy his singular stake to kill the ancient. They hang out a bit as if they are a normal couple. They fall asleep in the same bed. She wakes up and he eats her coochie in the morning. Cute. But Ivy is guarded and thinks that Ren is going to hurt her at some point. He won't mean to, but he will. So she essentially tells him this can't go any further. All of the order reconvene the day before the apocalypse to say, yo, it's a coming and some of y'all gonna die. We're gonna do no preparatory work at all. We're not gonna brief y'all, nothing. See you tomorrow. <laughs> Spend this day however you wish, cause many of you gonna die tomorrow. <laughs> Val goes to see her family and Ivy and Ren, who have no family, spend the day together and guess what they do? They f Well, in fairness, they had to do more trauma bonding where she told the story about how one time she took off her clover and that resulted in her being compelled to take the Fae to her family's house and it killed her adopted parents and her boyfriend. And then they f after that with the most beautiful song playing in the background. And one of the many frustrations I have with this movie, this is certainly the most um, annoying one, is that they don't put the name of the artist of this song in the credits. It's called, it's literally like the production companies. It's like saying Sony artist made a song here it is. And it's like, can you even legally do that? Like, is that a thing you can do? You have to say who performed something, no? The only way I can listen to the song is watching this stupid ass sex scene over and over again. I don't wanna watch this shit. But like, what type of white hot hell is it that you would have the firest song in this movie uncredited? Like who the fuck? Rin discovers Tank in the kitchen the next morning while he's butt naked and Tank is trying to get breakfast. He tries to kill Tank because he is something of the other world. And this is where we find out that apparently they're not called fairies, they're called brownies. Which almost feels even more homophobic. <laughs> She explains that she came across him one time when he was injured and she's just nursed him back to health and that's her pet, essentially. Girl, whatever. Anyway, I'm confused. Happy Pride! The day of the apocalypse. No plan, no thoughts, just vibes and war. They fight in this like incredibly small church. It looks like the after service area at a Baptist reception where you get cookies and your mom talks to everyone. But they're ready to fight against the Fae who are coming towards the gate to open it. Which doesn't make sense because haven't the Fae been coming through the gate this entire movie? Like what? Anyway, anyway. They're fighting towards the gate in the most pathetic looking fight scene I've ever seen in my life. Finally, Wigged Wig gets to the front of the gate and Val slices his throat so that his blood is drawn, which he touches and puts on the gate and now it is burst open. And guess who comes out? The prince of the other world. Ivy runs after Val, who has been in cahoots with the Fae this whole time, cause we didn't see that coming. She runs after her and she's going to get an item that we will never know what it is, in, at least in this movie. And who's there? The prince. There's a fight, she calls her some more pet names, something like Little Bird or something, ugh. She gets whipped around a bit, draws some blood, but once he comes close to her, he could smell that she smells of what? Halfling. Cause again, none of us saw that coming. And knowing that she could die and they need a halfling, he does some super power healing or something and heals her. And here comes Ren who takes her back to safety. Now Ivy's passed out and the next morning she's like, is it the apocalypse? And he's like, nah, quote, it wasn't as bad as we thought it was gonna be. We figured out how to close the gate. How? How did you manage? How did you go? How? Literally. <laughs> the whole problem with this movie is that once it's open, we don't know what the fuck we're gonna do to close it. You, the only way to close it is to use the blood of an ancient on the opposite side of the gate. And you don't explain it. They just say, we managed to get the gate closed. <laughs> I'm losing my mind. But I digress, they need to have sequel bait, so sure. And after he leaves, she recalls that the prince called her a halfling. She says this in front of Tink, who alludes to have always known to some degree that she is a halfling. She takes the special spear thing, the stake thing, and scratches her hand to find that her blood bubbles. She is a halfling, meaning that Ren, if he finds out, 
would be forced to kill her. And that's the end of the movie. It's like incredibly epic music plays. It's not bad. It just feels like so... This movie didn't earn this song. Yeah, this movie's a mess. And I will say, despite all my complaining of logistics and everything, as far as movies go on passion flicks, they tried a little, they tried. You know, there was some storyline outside of like two people meet and they f which I kind of appreciate because at some point they just gets very stale. The movie makes no sense and is, and is creepy at certain points as most romance tends to be for some reason. But damn, it was a wild ride. I'm not gonna lie, I'm hooked. I wanna know what's happening. What's happening? To, Cause I wanna know what happens when he finds out. How will he find out? I'm curious. And curiosity killed a lot of things, but not a good time. That, my friends, is all for today, folks. If you like this video, feel free to like this video. Follow me on all my social media, Instagram, Twitter, both of which are Kenny JD. If you have any more movie recommendations, feel free to put those down in my comment section and I will see you guys next time.